The Shah described land reform as the most deep-rooted and revolutionary action that can happen in the life of a nation. In Iran it was. In 14 years, the control of the feudal landlords who, along with foreign powers, were chiefly responsible for the country's lack of development, has been broken. All progress in Iran stems from that achievement. Today, though with varying degrees of success and failure, the peasant farmers are their own masters. Ghassam Radi is 44. He can't read or write. With his family, he works and owns five hectares of land, mainly rice. Gassam and his family are more fortunate than many other peasants whose lives have been changed by land reform. The land they've inherited is on Iran's Caspian seaboard. It's very fertile and water is plentiful. Before land reform, Gassam and his family were tenant farmers on the same five hectares of land. The landlord and his agents took 80% of the produce, beat the menfolk and abused their women. In straight money terms alone, the Radi family is several times better off than it was in the days before land reform. When I wanted a house, I had to ask the landlord. After asking him over and over again, he would provide me with one which would collapse. But this new house, I built myself, at my own expense, and with my own hands. For the land, Gassam has to pay a total of 1,300 pounds over 12 years. And he borrowed about the same amount to complete his house. Gassam Radi represents the top level of success attained by individual peasant farmers since land reform. But the success of collective efforts is bringing even greater prosperity to peasant farmers who, not more than a decade ago, were living in conditions even more dreadful than those of the villages of medieval Western Europe. This is the life today in a farm corporation in the south of Iran. It was formed three years ago by 400 peasant farmers from 17 villages. Our life is much better in many aspects, thank God. There is no shortage of drinking water, clothing, food. Our drinking water, the baths, all those things are much better now. Excellent much better now. In the old days in the villages, it wasn't like this. Now we have wash hand basins and sinks and baths. We have them all. Now, I notice he hasn't got a television. Most of his friends around here have got a television. Why has he not got one? Just at present, I've got no ready cash to buy one with. I have a daughter-in-law who was unwell. I spent all my money on her, between 500 and 600 pounds. Not all of the 17 villages which make up this farm corporation are prospering. Some of the peasant folk, apart from being better nourished, seem to be just as poor as they've ever been. But what has changed, and very dramatically, is their prospects. The better life they've only dreamed about is on its way. Take the case of Zad Husseini from this village. His father is dead, so at 16, young Zad Husseini, who has three sisters, is the head of the family. It's his responsibility to provide the better life, and he's doing that by skillfully exploiting every possibility offered to him by his membership of the farm corporation. 
His stake in the corporation, inherited from his father, is 10 hectares of land, which in turn he exchanged for 110 shares. At present, the family lives in a traditional mud house. It's clean, but that's all. Inside the mud walls, the rooms are dark and bare. There's no electricity, no piped water, no toilet facilities, nothing really. And the cattle live in, though in this house they do have separate rooms, a legacy from the days of anarchy when thieves roamed the villages at will. But this is soon to be the new life for the Zad Husseini family, a new house in the residential area of the farm corporation. It's costing them more than £6,000. They've put down a deposit of a quarter and have to pay the balance over 10 years. How can they afford it? Well, the value of their shares in the farm corporation has doubled in three years. With wages and other benefits added, the family's income has increased six-fold in the same period. It has to be admitted that this and other farm corporations in Iran could not have been formed and would not now be prospering without huge supporting investments in them by central government. But a formula for success has been found. Its potential is enormous if the flow of government funds can be maintained. The establishment and development of collective farms is an expensive business for the government. The farmers contribute their land but after that, it's the government which has to provide the funds to pay for land levelling, the provision of water, and to start with, managerial and training staff. <laughs> Under the reform programme, most of the land formerly owned by feudal landlords was transferred to 70% of the rural population. That's an achievement which no other developing country can match. But the benefits of land reform in Iran in terms of higher income for the land-owning peasant farmers haven't been evenly spread because of the shortage of government support funds. So farmers who've not yet been organized into collective groups, cooperatives and farm corporations are not so prosperous as either the Radi or the Zad Husseini families. And these farmers are many. Their incomes have barely kept pace with the rise in the price of non-foodstuffs. At present, only 13% of the total land area of Iran can support crops, and less than half of that is irrigated. Iran is a development planner's nightmare. Yet progress is reaching out to find and touch even the most forgotten of Iran's people, the nomads of Sistan and Baluchistan. Their lives are being saved and transformed. The desert is being forced to provide food, jobs and a future with security for the nomads of the area. This is a first crop of barley growing in what 18 months ago was desert. The name of this place is Tahlab Mirjawa. Unlikely as it may seem, it's a new town in the making, a place of permanent settlement for the nomads whose chances of survival in the surrounding desert and the mountains beyond are decreasing with each year.
Until now, their lives have been unchanged since time began. The nomads are prepared to give up their wandering life and settle because there's no alternative. Out on the tracks, their sheep are dying from lack of water. My brothers and I had almost 300 sheep. There are only 60 or 70 left now. But if he had to stay out in the desert now, if there wasn't this scheme here in Talab, this uh, new development scheme, what would have happened? We would have lived in the same misery. We would have tried to get to Pakistan or Afghanistan to fetch wheat on our camels. And what about his children? Does he think they will grow up and want to settle here for, for the rest of their lives? I only wish to God that there will be progress and work here, so that I can bring them all together here to get work. Work and security there will be for an increasing number of nomad families and their children as Tahlab grows and takes on the shape of a small town. Now there are 200 hectares of desert land under cultivation. In 12 months' time, there'll be 500. At present, the nomads working here are employed as casual laborers. But as pioneers in this development project, they'll be the first to receive title deeds to the land, which they'll be able to exchange in time for shares in the farm corporation to be established here. The man whose iron will is responsible for the Tahlab project is Governor General Mani, the Shah's personal representative in the province. These are tomatoes here, are they? Yes, these are tomatoes. Uh, the purpose of that is to provide some uh, foods that at present we need badly in Zahida market. But given that tomatoes are growing quite healthily now, I think, in what was desert 18 months ago, does yeah. that mean that the food production, uh, the potential here is enormous, provided that it, it, it's, it's handled properly. Yes, I believe so, but uh, uh, you know that is a barren soil, and we have to uh, work a little bit with that soil, wash down the first this, um, uh, excessive uh, m minerals that they have, and then make it ready for a successful vegetable growing. So at present, most of our task is to improve the soil by uh, sowing like barley and the uh, wheat and the alfalfa and the, this kind of uh, crops. It's that to are consolidate more, the, the soil. These are more resistant to these mm -hmm. conditions. And then by plowing this under, we are adding some humus to the soil and sweetening that one. So making uh, ready for a successful vegetable growing. But if we survey this land out here now, mm. in five years from now, what is going to be growing out here? Maybe tomato, maybe eggplant, maybe lettuce, or any kinds of vegetables that people need here. Governor General Manny never takes no for an answer. Even the fragile seedlings seem to grow to his will in the desert soil. It was on his instructions that Iranian consulting engineers surveyed the desert for water. When they reported their findings, plenty of water, with the advice that exploiting it was not an economic proposition, he politely told them and various government officials to go to hell. And now the water flows. One main problem in Iran is that many costly development projects like this are not economically viable in the short term. But without them, and because the country was so backward, there could be no social or political progress. In such circumstances, decision-making about what to spend and where is a high-risk business. That's why many in authority in Iran are reluctant to accept the responsibility for decision-making and why many decisions are left to the Shah.
Still in Baluchistan, this is Dalgam, an established settlement for nomads soon to form a farm corporation in what, three years ago, was empty desert. Here, 24 wells support 450 families who grow wheat, barley, beans and cucumbers. This is how Talhab will grow. And this is Iran Shah, a city which grew out of the desert. This too is how Talhab and Dalgan before it will grow. It's estimated that Iran Shah's population of mainly nomads will rise from 20,000 to 300,000 in 15 years. Many of the nomads already settled here are being trained in a whole variety of town trades and semi-skilled jobs. Governor General Mani believes that Iran Shah will become the centerpiece of development takeoff in Baluchistan. There's a different approach to the problem of bringing the nomads into the 20th century in the southern part of Iran, where they are the main suppliers of meat for the whole country. In a good year when it rains, the nomads can supply 10 million head of sheep. In a bad year, only 3 million. By providing health care, improved breeds of sheep and feedlots on the grazing trails to make up for the lack of rain, this huge meat complex is aiming to stabilize production. Over 10 years, and because of rising incomes, the consumption per head of meat in Iran has quadrupled. By the time nomad workers have been fully trained in production line skills, the complex expects to be exporting 60% of its meat and byproducts to the Persian Gulf and Europe. The training instructor is an Australian. Well, personally, I think they've adapted very well to the machinery. I think the main thing is, for the first time, they've got a machine above their head and they've got some pride within themselves. And there seems to be a great uh, conflict between each boy of how many sheep they're going to shear per day. So there's a good motivation Yeah, there. good motivation. They're always looking to their left, to the right, to see which, how many sheep their opposite number is shearing. How many are they managing to shear a day now, per man? We're averaging, each man is averaging 100 sheep per, per person per day. And after how much training is that? This is after about seven months training. So how would that compare with the people you know in Australia, for example? This compares on par with Australia. In five or six years' time, it's only experience they need. They'll be right up with the top boys. Since people are a nation's most precious resource, even when you've got oil, it is necessary for Iran to capitalize on the productive potential of her nomadic people. But whether it's appropriate to describe what's happening to them as part of the civilizing process, a phrase used even by some Iranian development planners is open to question. If you're from an advanced and industrialized society, it's the nomads of Iran, with their warmth and their hospitality and their joy of the simple life, who cause you to question your own notions of the term civilization and what it means. Iran will be the poorer if the values these people symbolize are sacrificed to the god progress. If to some extent the nomads are disappearing, 
The new wanderers along new trails are the youngsters of the various service corps the Shah created for the fight against poverty. <laughs> In Iran, military service for two years is compulsory, but each year thousands of young women and young men too take up the option of serving their time in a development corps. The literacy corps and the health corps are the main ones. After five and a half months of military and other appropriate training, corps workers are assigned to a rural area for 18 months where they may be on their own with strangers. Thus the need for training in the finer arts of self-defense. Since the health corps was established in 1964, it's estimated that its clinics in the rural areas have received and treated patients who've made a total of 30 million visits. At the health corps clinics, there's a registration fee of about seven pence a visit. After that, everything is free. At present, Iran needs an additional 21,000 doctors. Without the health corps, the situation would be desperate. Like all of the doctors in the health corps, Farooq Ghazimuti is a graduate of a medical college. In addition to their own knowledge and skills, the doctor's biggest weapon in the fight against the diseases of poverty and infant mortality in particular is the free milk and supplementary food which the government provides for over 7 million children. Since many village women don't have enough breast milk because they have too many children too quickly, what would happen if the free milk was not available? The death rate for babies would be higher, their resistance would be lower, there would be more infections, diarrhea and vomiting. They would get lung infections too. There would be a lack of vitamins and they would drink sugared water just as they used to do. So from what the doctor's been saying, the supplementary milk is very, very important in the lives of these babies. Very important. But there isn't enough for all the children here. Because this milk scheme is a new one. Perhaps in a couple of years' time there will be sufficient for everybody. On the other hand, family planning will be in operation, and so there will be fewer children. So there will be more milk to go round. The dispensaries at most health corps clinics are well stocked, but it's the free milk which mothers demand more and more. Most of the milk has to be imported, so it's a huge drain on Iran's foreign exchange. The provision of it for seven million children at vast expense is therefore proof of the government's determination to improve the lives of the poorest. Dr. Gazimuti is responsible for three villages where the subject of family planning is a priority. The doctor knows that it's the high rate of infant mortality caused by malnutrition which triggers the population explosion. So she concentrates her efforts on teaching mothers how to improve the diet of their children to reduce the rate of infant mortality. In 12 years, health corps workers have played a significant role in helping to wipe out the extremes of malnutrition and related diseases. Now they can turn with more chance of success to the job of persuading parents to practice family planning. How long does it take for the doctor to persuade a young mother like this uh, to have birth control? She needs to come here five or six times, then she comes with her husband, then she asks her mother-in-law for permission. It all takes about three or four months. So often the real problem is, n is not the young mother or even the husband, it is the mother-in-law. Is that this doctor's experience? Yes, the young people are more easily persuaded, but the mother-in-law is a little backwards. Mothers-in-law like there to be more children. Do you know why it is that these people want more children? I saw a woman yesterday who was crying. 
She said she had one son and four daughters and said, when they grow up, my son will marry and leave us. Who will provide for us? My husband is dead too. If I had another son, how easy things would be because he would provide for us. Now when I have only one son and he goes off, what can I do by myself with four daughters? There is no life insurance for people here. Dr. Gazimuti and many thousands like her in Iran is working to provide that life insurance by fighting poverty. Mrs. Palizban is the lady governor of Moshad province in the northeastern corner of Iran. She is touring a village damaged by a flood. The role being played by women in a country of Muslim faith with its traditions of male domination and superiority is in itself more proof of how deeply the Shah's reform program has taken root. The significance of Mrs. Palisban's appointment is that Mashhad is Iran's holy city, the last place in the country where you'd expect the first lady governor to be appointed. Fortunately, from the point of view of legislation, I believe that we now enjoy full equality. The only thing that I consider of great importance is the raising of the level of women's education in all spheres, and particularly among village women and women workers, so that they can get to understand their position and benefit from their equality. In some of the poorest parts of the country, the education of the village women, the mums, is already underway. But such things can happen only when the mullahs, the religious leaders, consent, and many of them are still uncertain about the wisdom of this much progress. The actual progress in the emancipation of women in Iran is even more remarkable than it may seem because opposition to it by religious fanatics still manifests itself in the promotion of terrorism in alliance with communist groups. On the site of what used to be Tehran's biggest slum, a huge modern school complex for 5,000 former slumland children. If governments have the political will and the economic resources, it's easy to provide well-equipped schools, universities, hospitals and so on. For Iran's city folk, and the children in particular, no expense is spared to provide the most modern and up-to-date facilities. The face of the cities and the future prospects for Iran's urban children have been changed beyond recognition in 14 years. But the less obvious success stories are sometimes the most dramatic, as the story of education in Iran shows. In a place where there's people, however remote, there's usually a school. There's hardly a road or trackway through fields and mountains and desert where, at certain times of the day, you can't see children on the move to and from school. In 12 years, the number of children attending school has nearly quadrupled. Illiteracy has been reduced from 85 to nearly 50 percent, which just goes to emphasize how backward Iran was. In every village, even the poorest, the first demand is for a school. This is one of over 11,000 schools or classes where the teachers are provided by the Education Corps. Why such a great thirst for education? 
the Shah's revolution has succeeded in making the people of Iran aware of their needs and their rights. Even the poor have realized for themselves that education is not an end in itself, but a means to development and a better life. And so to the most remarkable of all of Iran's achievements in the field of education. The tribal schools. What's so remarkable about these tribal schools? Simply this. In all national examinations throughout Iran, up to and including university levels, it's the nomad children from these schools who consistently obtain the best results and the greatest number of distinctions. <laughs> Part of the explanation for their high level of academic achievement, it said, is the fact that nomad children have pure or virgin minds, minds unspoiled and uncluttered by the values and prejudices of materialistic and permissive societies. When the tribes move, the tent schools move with them. Most of the tribal schools around the country are to be found in remote desert and mountain regions. The students in the tent schools insist on keeping long hours. Often they study from sun up to sundown. There's a tribal school song. The blackboard is my rifle, the words say, the chalk, my bullet. The message of the song is well understood by parents without education of their own. The teachers in the tent schools are from the tribes. The whole concept of tribal schools was invented by nomads for nomads. It's a response to the fact that urban or city people, politicians and civil servants are unable and sometimes unwilling to solve the development problems of rural folk. What thoughts must now be in the minds of those being freed from the chains of ignorance and poverty? After five years in the tent schools, the nomad children move on to a secondary school, modern but still tribal. My tribal people have been forgotten and left out of everything for so long, now they deserve everything we can give them. The feelings of the creator of the tribal system, Dr. Bahman Begi. <laughs> Bahman Begi is a unique and delightful man. He performs with the sublime confidence of one who believes he is the true repository of the wisdom of the ages. Do you know English? Yes. What is the capital of England? London. What is the capital of Iceland? Reykjavik. What is the capital of Cyprus? Nicosia. What is the capital of Switzerland? Ben. What is the capital of Egypt? Cairo. Another reason for the high level of academic successes gained by the nomad children is their spirit, their enthusiasm. They want to learn about everything. Children, we are going to find out the chemical qualities of a substance. Does the molecular structure change or not? To find this out, we make a solution of salt and water. 
We put salt in water and stir it. Then the salt molecules mix with the water molecules and the salt is dissolved. If we taste it, the taste is salty. After just two months of learning English at the secondary school, many of these nomad children are more proficient at writing the language than are lots of English children after some years of practice. The students, the students. <laughs> they are in the garden. In the garden. Beautiful. I've heard say that something like eight out of ten of your tribal children actually go to university. Is that true? It's wrong, sir. Nine out of ten. And that school, that high school of ours, um, I should boast a little bit and say that it's a source of the pride of our country where we take the very low income uh, children of the families. The people who were the poorest and the, the most poorest, the, 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 but talented. We bring them here and that's the democratization of the education. Probably in very few places of the world, west or east, you can find a system which takes care so much of the low-income families of the country. We bring them from those families and they go right into the highest universities of the country. And uh, that, is, that uh, high school you already have seen. And as I told you last year, for example, we had 52 just uh, graduates from the high school. Out of this 52, 50 went straight to the universities. And nine of them to the medical faculty of the Pahlavi University. Which is the best university in the, the country? The best university of the country. That university accepted mm, 85 just uh, graduates from all over the country, nine of them from the tribal school, one school. In 14 years, the number of students receiving higher education throughout Iran has increased by seven times, from 24,000 to nearly 170,000. Fourteen years ago, there were only nine universities in Iran. Today, there are 70 universities, colleges, and centers of higher education. Most significant of all, the number of peasant and working class children with access to university and higher education has jumped from 8 to 40 percent of the total. In other and less obvious ways, education is being put to work to change the lives of those still poor. Neshat Naziri is a village health worker. Her job is to use education as a weapon to fight ignorance, the root cause of poverty, at the village level. Her task, in short, is to make education relevant to the basic needs of the poorest peasants. I told you before, I mean about the cows, I told you to make a fence for them. How can I? I have no fencing materials. Having no fencing materials is no excuse. I told you last time about the dirt in the yard. I also told you about the dirtiness of your toilet. We are in hardship here. What can I do? As you know, this house is very cramped. Come over here. Look at your toilet. I told you about it before, didn't I? I'm really ashamed in front of you. Never mind, never mind. Get your husband to make some mud bricks. When they are made, he can build it up in one day, just as he did for the other room over there. You did that job because you had to. You must make yourself do this one, too. If you want to be fit and well in this yard, not be ill all the time, you must see to this business of the cows. If God helps us and we can afford it, we will do it no matter how hard it is, but we need space. 
If we had the space, I would go and do as you say, no matter what hard work was necessary. I would go and make a place for the animals. I swear to God that this village is in want. We can't afford things. We have no space. We have to live with the animals. In practice, the village health worker's job is to make peasant folk understand that effects have causes, that sickness and disease is a consequence of squalor, and that improved nutrition can prevent much illness. What do you give the baby besides cow's milk? The same food as we eat. Don't you give it the yolk of eggs or something like that? I used to, but not now. Why not? I don't give it now. Go on giving it. It's very good for it in every way. If you get into the habit of putting a teaspoonful of yolk in its morning milk, it will do it a great deal of good. Egg is very good for it, especially for its motions. You must go on giving it. In general, is your baby fitter now than it was before? Yes, it's better now. Why? Because it's well fed. In two years, the infant mortality rate in 57 villages served by this scheme has been halved. You've only to compare the stories of the old folk with the young to appreciate the changes in even the poorest villages of Iran. About how old is this, uh, this lady here, this one? Five years old. Fifty-five years old. And how many children has she had? Nine births. Nine births. Right. And how many of those children have lived? Three of them. Right. So six have died. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, six of them died. At what ages did they die and what did they die of? Does she know? Well, mm, one year, three years, four years, oh. and uh, mm, a lot of other sicknesses that she cannot name it. So this is the new generation now. This lady has how many children? Chanta Bachi Dani Shuma? Two. Two. And and both are well. Yes. And how many more children is she going to have? Chanta Gi Bachi Mukha Dashta Bashi. None. She's a bit shy, yes. Yes. She doesn't want any more, why not? No more. I cannot care for them, these two is enough. Yeah, and, and this uh, village health worker has motivated her, has she? Has she been persuading her not to have more children? Yes. 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 From every point of view, she can look after her children better if she has two than she could if she had five. If she had five children, she would have to buy five pairs of shoes and five shirts. If she only had two, she only has to buy two pairs. Huh? Not all of the illnesses of village folk can be dealt with by a village health worker with five years secondary education and six months training in the basic principles of community health. But the low-level village health workers, as they're called, are trained to know when a problem is too big for them. Then, as in this case, they'll refer the patient upwards to a middle-level village health worker. The village health worker is also responsible for educating the village school children about all matters relating to health and hygiene. Today it's a lecture on piped water and how to use it to prevent the spread of germs and diseases. The whole emphasis is on prevention, not cure. What's illustrated here is that the education needs of the poor in all developing countries are much more basic than people in advanced societies ever realize. Villagers, and not just children, have to be told repeatedly why they must wash their hands after going to the toilet and so on.
برای شما که درست کردن به خاطر که از این آب بهداشت The real success the project organizers are looking for is in 10 years time when today's children are parents so progress made now is a bonus I like this work in every way I accepted the job so as to be able to help my fellow countrymen I took a six-month course and I learned a lot about how things are done. I got myself trained. I can now instruct other people. For example, about how to care for babies, both as regards feeding them and as regards cleanliness and hygiene. I look after my own baby myself now with these points in mind. So I should very much like others to do the same as I do. Really, I would even do this work without pay, because I believe in it completely. Must one work only for money? Nasat Naziri's tiny mud-walled clinic was built and furnished by the villagers. It cost them roughly a pound a head, which for them is a lot. The villagers' willingness to contribute in this way towards a solution to their own problems was the condition on which they were assigned a village health worker. Such a condition is enforced in all 57 villages in this scheme because one main objective is to encourage the villagers to help themselves. Being in charge at the clinic building also helps to give authority and prestige to the village health worker. And they do need that. This is all filth. He gets rashes because of this filth. No, no, madam. Sometimes he gets very itchy. Are there some on his back as well? Yes. Sometimes he gets very itchy, very uncomfortable. He gets like this. Let me see his back. It's better now. Is that all? Are there any on his head? His head is much better too. We have had to spend so much already. His poor father. Don't wrap him up in so much clothing. Well, he's cold. It's all these clothes that cause the rashes. No air is getting to his body. If air reaches him, the rash won't appear. You should wash him too. Look at his face. You see? You see? The back of his head is better? Yes. Look, sister, do you see what has happened to him here? You've wrapped him in three layers of cloth. You should put less on him. If you put less on his head, air will get below his chin and onto his body. No rash will appear. It has to be said that village health workers achieve most success in communities which are not absolutely poor. For permanent progress, much depends on whether families can be persuaded to build new houses outside the walls of the old mud villages. In this place, Mashala Musavi, the village health worker, has persuaded 60 of 126 families to move. We have laid the foundations and I'm waiting to see what the crops bring in so that we can build upwards. Now, why did he move out? Was it because this man here, the village uh, health worker, did he persuade him to move? This good man? He tells us that the cleaner our place is, the happier we shall be. The cleaner it is, the better. One needs to find the energy to clean the place up. Of course, if I can build this place with mud bricks and make a good clean job of it, it will be much better than what we had before. What are the arguments that he uses when he tries to persuade people to leave the old villages where they're in sanitary conditions? What are the arguments he uses to persuade them? I talk to them quietly and tell them that if they have a house that is clean with a door and a window facing the sun, that is much better than living in a house which has no windows and is dark. One gets sick there. 
We tell them this for their own good. It makes no difference to us. It isn't us who fall ill, it is them. Then they realize what we say is for their own good. If somebody has a hygienic toilet with proper stones and a cover and a ceiling, that is good for him, not for me. I'm only instructing him so that his children won't fall sick as long as hygiene is maintained. They will live in greater comfort and be happy and healthy. Iran's development effort has a very authentic feel about it because ordinary people, including the very poor, are participating in the search for solutions to their own problems. In the Shah's view, participation is the very essence of democracy. Oil pays for the development program which in turn makes democracy a possibility. But in about 25 years from now, Iran's refineries will be shut down. Oil will be finished. So Iran is attempting to become an industrialized nation to reduce her dependence on imports, which she won't be able to afford in such vast quantities as now. So it's a race against time. The most prestigious and the most important of all industrial projects in Iran is the steel mill at Arya Shah near Esfahan. Since many of Iran's hopes for becoming an industrial power are dependent on success here, it's perhaps not surprising that steel production in Iran is the subject of intrigue and rivalry between East and West in classic Cold War terms, which, in case you were wondering, is why workers at the mill have to pass through the most intensive security checks. The essential points of a long and complicated story are these. Iran set its heart on building a steel mill in the days of the Shah's father. Western countries refused to help because they wanted to keep Iran as a consumer, dependent on them for supplies. Finally, and in desperation, the Shah turned for help to the Russians. As you might imagine, there's much of the story from here on that can't yet be told. The situation now is that Iran, with outside help, is trying to speed up production to get rid of the remaining Russian technicians and advisers ahead of schedule. And the Russians take advantage of whatever opportunities come their way to slow down production.
With friends like Western nations, Iranians could surely be forgiven for wondering if they need enemies. Elsewhere in the industrial sector, Iranian workers attach great significance to the fact that two of the 17 points of the Shah's revolutionary charter provide the mechanism for increasing their income. Profit sharing has been in operation for some years. Added to that now is a very radical scheme to provide workers with 49% of the shares in all companies which can show a profit over three years. Workers can even buy shares on credit with a low interest government loan. Each worker is limited on the number of shares he can buy and the sale of shares is staggered deliberately to give those who can't afford to buy now a chance later. The influence of trade unions and their equivalent is restricted by law and reality. Reality being the fact that living standards are rising every year. If the possession of a television set is an indicator of rising living standards, then the towns and cities of Iran are prospering. If you forget the new problems which rapid industrial growth brings, the pace of development in Iran's towns and cities, this is Tehran, more than justifies the Shah's assertion that Iran is taking off like a rocket. Where before there was nothing, just barren land, new towns and new cities are appearing as if by magic. The new towns and cities are much more than superficial symbols of what can justly be called a development miracle. Fourteen years ago, there was effectively no middle class in Iran. Today, and in comparison with what was, around 40% of the country's entire population could be termed middle class. When one shovel, huge and mechanical though it is, costs more than 400,000 pounds, you can appreciate the kind of money Iran is spending on her industrial development program. At more than half a billion pounds, this particular venture represents one of Iran's biggest single investments in her future. There used to be a mountain here. It's being demolished, blown up, and the rubble cleared away so that Iran can get at the ore of very good quality that may make her one of the world's top exporters of copper during the next decade. Thirty seconds to blast radio silence. In addition to copper, Iran has probably the biggest reserves of natural gas in the world. Iran is not short of natural resources. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. It's the shortage of skilled manpower which most threatens the pace and the quality of Iran's growth as an industrial power. Iran's great disadvantage is that none of those on whom she must rely for the future have been brought up in an industrial background. In training for industry, Iran has had to start from scratch. Last month's casual labourers, many of them peasant folk, have to become next month's technicians. In many fields, Iranians have shown themselves to be very adaptable once they've been shown how to do something. The number of large factories and industrial establishments has grown from 500 to 6,000 in 25 years, which helps to explain why there's a shortage of trained manpower. 
Some of Iran's reasonably well-informed critics say the Shah must be mad to think he can succeed in turning his country into a major industrial nation within the allotted time and with the quality of manpower he's got and is likely to get. Maybe the Shah's gamble is a desperate one, but it's difficult to see that he's got any choice if he's to change the historical pattern of advance and collapse, advance and collapse in Iran. But there are big question marks. Is the Shah really as informed as he needs to be about the strains his demands are imposing on those who do most of the work? Take, for example, the case of a production manager at the steel mill. He says what others around the country would say if they had the courage to speak out against the system, which is Iranian shorthand for those with influence on the decision-making process who exaggerate success stories and underestimate the problems. David Noja. I've been here in Islamia five years. I had the lowest job in this rolling mill. I have the toughest one now. But uh, during these years, I was under such a strain that uh, I feel, maybe because of my own uh, low capacity of, for working or energy, I, I feel that I cannot continue in a, in a system like this. I mean, is this a result of the strain? You've been working, what, 16, 17 hours a day for five years? We have been working sometimes more than 16 hours. We uh, normally work about 10, 12 hours a day. And it's not only working, it's things that, you know, goes around. We have difficulty with the workers, we have difficulties with the uh, equipment, not enough equipment, not, uh, not enough people who are uh, educated enough to do the job like they are supposed to. I myself, I'm not very experienced for my job. My counterpart in America or Europe has about 15, 20 years of experience. I'm doing all that, maybe more, with less experience, so it's all a strain. And this strain has finally accumulated and you feel you just can't take it anymore? I feel I'm getting sick. I, I feel I cannot take it anymore. I've, I've already told my superiors I cannot take it. What, what I wonder is the lesson of your particular story that others should learn. Is it that, in a sense, Iran is trying to go too fast? Well, I, I feel that Iran can go faster than what it, it's going now. But I'm just worried that maybe this pace is too much for us. We could go faster, but maybe with, perhaps with a little more changes in discipline, with the areas in management, with the, with the people who care more. I, I really feel we don't have enough people who care about Iran. They feel about themselves. I think the only, the only thing they care about is their own life, their car, their home, their houses, their family. That's the only thing they think about. So Not dedicated to, the, to Iran. I, I, don't, I think that's my opinion. You, you feel in summary that things won't change for the better until there are more people who are dedicated to the country and less, less concerned for their own interest? Well, isn't that the case in any country? If you want to go ahead, you have to have dedicated people. Yes, but the problem for Iran is that you've got to try and do in 30, 40 years what many other countries, my country, has done in uh, 100, 200 years. That's true. But <coughs> one thing about Iran, what I saw that encouraged me anyway, was that during the time I wasn't in here, I saw things that in co compared to 2,500, whatever it is in our history, these 10 years or 8 years, I feel was much more than all those 2,500. I mean, I'm not comparing it to Europe, I'm comparing it to our own history. We, we can see what we have done, what has been done in 8 years. But if, if the thing, the people, the type of thinking that we have, doesn't change, it can turn to be only a show, nothing else.
On the agricultural front, some Iranians believe there's a danger that development progress will turn out to be insufficient for Iran's needs if some of the present policies are not changed. One urgent need is for many more extension officers, like this young core worker in Baluchistan, to teach and advise peasant farmers on how to get more from their land. The peasants are very willing to help themselves, but there aren't enough sincerely motivated extension workers willing to suffer the hardships of the remote areas. The government records show there are on paper a large number of extension officers, mostly civilians. But an extension service modeled on the United States of America is irrelevant to Iran's needs. In America, a farmer knows he has a problem and can jump into his Jeep or Cadillac and go to see the extension officer. In Iran, many of the poorest peasant farmers don't even know they have a problem. Government figures correctly show that Iran's per capita income has risen from 100 to more than 800 pounds in 12 years. But for the poorest 30% or so of peasant farmers, those figures are misleading. Of course, thank God, life is better nowadays. I wouldn't say that it isn't. But there are difficulties in farming. A year's wheat farming gives us our food, but doesn't meet other expenses like clothes, sugar and tea. We are very short of those things. We suffer hardship. I work on the land. If anything is made out of it, I get it. If nothing is made out of it, I get nothing. I earn no wages or salary. This land is my salary. If it produces something, I get it. If it doesn't, I get nothing. If they went to school, if they didn't work, where would they get these dresses? It's the work she takes on which provides the dress. Some collective farms formed since land reform can now provide shareholders with sickness and unemployment benefits. But the small farmers who are still on their own have no such protection. And old age provides no comfort. I would like to rest, but I couldn't earn my living like that. It's true, sir. God knows that I have no strength for work, but my livelihood depends on it. If I don't work, I die. At vocational training schools for students of agriculture around the country, the search is on for new ways to help the poorest farmers increase their production. Most of the students enter the centres with not much more than minimum education. The job of the centres is to provide them with higher education and motivate them to take their knowledge back to the land. The trouble is, the very success of the Shah's revolution has so raised expectations that pretty well all of these students are not prepared to work on the land like their fathers before them. They want to be managers. Farming does not yet provide the means to support the improved lifestyle that increasing numbers of Iranians, in particular the young, now expect their education to give them.
the national director of training for the vocational centers, is a civil servant frustrated to near the point of resignation by government policies. From what we have seen and heard, it would seem that there is no chance of motivating younger people back to the land until farming can be made more productive to provide a better life. Do you think that's true? That is true, 100%. We should try and make the agriculture more productive, more the people be able to make more money to be encouraged to work in this line. This would argue that perhaps the government priorities are absolutely wrong, that there is too much investment in industry and not enough in farming. Do you I think, think that's true? Industry without agriculture doesn't mean anything to the nation. The agriculture is more important than industry, and furthermore, if we have agriculture, we can have industry. But industry without agriculture is nothing. Good afternoon. The critics of present policies want more investment funds for projects that will modernize Iran's agriculture more by transforming it and less by replacing traditional farming methods. That calls for less overspending on capital-intensive technology, which replaces too quickly too many people who must depend on the land for their livelihood. <laughs> Only in this way, say the opponents of present policies, will young people be persuaded that government is as serious as it claims to be about improving the living standards of all. The critics have spoken freely, the Shah has heard them, and now he's on their side. Perhaps the greatest symbol of change in Iran is Bahman Begi and his achievements. None were more forgotten than the nomad children of the most remote parts of the country. Today there are none so proud of their liberation from the chains of ignorance. When we were talking with the chief earlier today, he said that he was so grateful to the king that if the king asked that eight of his sons be killed in a sacrifice, he would do that. Mm. Was, he, was he joking or did he really mean that? Did I swear to his royal crown with God as my witness. I really mean if I see his majesty's signature on a paper that I can keep in my pocket, which requires me to sacrifice my sons, I would do so willingly. But not if they show me a paper, then kill my sons, and then take the paper away. I swear by his majesty and his throne, that is what I would do. We pay nothing for the children's pens or pencils or paper. They get suits of clothes, clothes that our forefathers never dreamed of. Our children have them now. How do you expect us not to be devoted to His Majesty? Why should we not be proud of all these things? His Imperial Majesty, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the Shan Shah of Iran, the son of a peasant, waited 26 years for his coronation. There was, he said, no pride in being the king of a poor people. This day too, Queen Farah was crowned. If the Shah dies or is assassinated before the Crown Prince is of age to succeed, Queen Farah will assume the full powers of the sovereign. 